Okay, hey everybody. Um, so I'm going to be talking about synthesizing Verilog for a specific device that you have the option of using for a project. Um, I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to go through it um, as quickly as possible while still being understandable. But just feel free to yell at me if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions. Okay, so we're talking about from Verilog to hardware, and Salma already described to you um, how to write Verilog, how to simulate Verilog code. Uh, and how that translates into actual gates. And what I'm going to be talking about is kind of the portion of that that's more downstream, that's closer to the actual hardware, uh, to the actual FPGA itself. So if you look at the entire FPGA synthesis flow, uh, the top two things here in black are what Salma talked about. Um, and after you have Verilog written, somehow it's translated into a description of the nets and the devices, <coughs> Um, you know, the logic gates, etc., required to actually realize the design you wrote. Um, and then somehow that is um, translated into a device specific placement of these logic blocks, routing of these logic blocks, and eventually that's translated into something called a bit stream, which is the actual binary data that's loaded onto whatever device you have. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but essentially, when you've written the Verilog code, this is translated, depending on the device you're using, into uh, programmable wires, programmable interconnects, and uh, programmable logic blocks. So your code may be compiled and your compiler may say, okay, you need a multiplexer here, uh, you need an AND gate here, an OR gate here, and they need to be wired in this specific pattern. And your synthesis tool, your compiler, will take care of all of that for you. Uh, but your device itself, your FPGA in our example, <coughs> needs to actually have whatever logic blocks, whatever wires that your synthesis tool um, has translated your Verilog into. Uh, okay, and so just kind of pictorially, the place and route will say, um, okay, you needed this multiplexer and this decoder. Uh, I'm going to choose to use this logic block on your FPGA and this one, and I'll wire them together in this fashion. And it's going to try to do that in some way that's efficient, that's optimal, that uses the fewest number of logic blocks um, possible, etc. And this just kind of gives you an overview of how this is done. You don't actually have to do that part. It's all done for you. Uh, but somebody you know, before you has come and, and written this compiler, the synthesis tool that does all these smart, intelligent, and efficient things. Okay, so the FPGA that I'm going to be showing you today uh, which is also the same one that you will be using if you do the optional design assignment. It's called the Lattice ICE40 HX8K. And it looks like this. Uh, and the main things you're looking at here are the actual FPGA on the top. That's where all your gates are loaded into uh, with the orange circle. A little chip below that that stores the entire program of your FPGA. And then everything else is just taking code, uh, binary data from your computer over USB and programming your device. Okay, uh, so traditionally these tools are kind of these large software packages written by the manufacturers uh, and more recently we have, um, you know, we're lucky enough to have open source development tools which allows us to kind of distribute these FPGAs to a classroom like this and the actual tools we're using for the netlist, the placing route, the downloading, etc are these tools listed here, and they are collectively known as the IceStorm open source FPGA development environment, uh, written only by a handful of people, so this is a, a huge effort, um, and I'll be showing you how to use these tools, but this is something that's open source, it's still in development, it only supports a handful of FPGAs, and it just so happens that the one that we have available to you is one that's supported by um, the software package. Okay, uh, so enough talking. I want to get into actually how do you synthesize some basic code? What does it look like loading it onto your FPGA? And what's the result of that? Um, okay, so again, the, the FPGA we're using today, um, you don't have unlimited logic blocks. You can't put, um, you know, an infinite number of gates on any of these devices. This particular one has 8,000 logic blocks, which is not going to be an issue for anything you'll write. It has eight LEDs you can blink and use to decode, uh, debug your code, um, whatever you want. And the input clock, so if you're dealing with flip-flops, sequential logic, or anything like that, 
is 12 megahertz. Okay? Uh, and then you have some RAM, and it's compatible with the toolchain we talked about. Okay, if you wanted to install something, um, if you wanted to install all of this software, it's best if you are on Mac or Linux. Um, the link to these installation processes is on the top here. Uh, there are some special instructions if you're on Mac. It's not really hard if you're on any, any of those. If you're on Windows, you have two options. You can either pair with somebody that has a Mac or a Linux distribution, or I've made a virtual machine image, so you would download a free version of VirtualBox, which allows you to uh, run Linux on whatever uh, operating system you have. You take the image I created, and then you can boot up into an image of Linux. So you're going to be working with Linux or Mac. Uh, it's just if you have Windows, you're going to be working on Linux within Windows. Okay, and all the examples I'm going to be talking about today are available on GitHub. Um, so feel free to download those and play around with them. Okay, so a general hierarchy for the projects I'm going to be showing you. The first one is just LED blinking. Uh, and you will have um, a higher level folder. This one's called Blinky. And that's where all your Verilog code will go. Uh, for the simple projects, you will only have a single .v, a single Verilog file. And common practice is to call the highest level Verilog file top.v. It's your top level highest most Verilog file. Any additional files you wrote, for example, things that have modules that you wrote that you want to include, uh, you can include in this folder as well. And then you have another file called a pin map, a .pcf file. And essentially what that does is it translates the named variables you came up with, for example, LED. If I want LED to be one of my outputs, I need to know how does that LED1, LED2, etc., how does that translate into an actual physical pin on my FPGA. So that's taken care of by you. You have to do that in the pin map.pcf file. I'll show you what that looks like. It's very simple. And then if you are familiar with Unix-style um, compilation, I have something called a make file. This is also in GitHub. So if you're unfamiliar with this, don't be too intimidated. This all comes uh, as part of the package. This allows you to synthesize and to program everything you have. You'll type two commands. One's make. One is make burn. Make will compile and synthesize everything. Make burn will push that onto the FPGA. And that's all you need. Um, inside the build folder, these are things that the compiler, the synthesizer, makes as intermediate steps. You don't have to deal with any of this, but if you're curious about it, you can open them up and read them. Okay, so here's some Verilog code that blinks LEDs. Uh, there's eight LEDs, like I said, and we're going to blink them according to an input clock. Okay, so the input clock on our device is 12 megahertz, and I'm calling it HW clock, hardware clock. Uh, and then I have eight outputs, and I have a 32-bit bus called counter. Uh, and by the way, this syntax here, uh, if you can see that, 32 apostrophe B0, that means I initialize it to a 32-bit value. I define it in binary to be zero. I could have had a D instead of the B, which means I define it in decimal syntax, and I would put a zero, and it'd be the same thing anyways. Okay, you can access a multi-bit bus as you would in um, most programming languages with these square brackets. So then I have these combinatorial statements like assign LED1 equals counter bit 18. Okay, and the reason I have bits 18 through 25 here and not 0 through 7, for example, is because we have a hardware clock that's running at 12 megahertz and we're not going to be able to visualize 12 megahertz blinking on an LED, but we can visualize 12 megahertz divided by 2 to the 18, for example. So these are the higher bits of our counter, and we're going to be able to visualize the LEDs blinking on this counter. Okay, and now we have an always block at the bottom here. This is like what Salma described. Uh, every time you have a positive edge on the input hardware clock, I will add one to my counter. Now you see I just have a straight plus sign here. Um, depending on your hardware, you can just do sometimes these simple um, arithmetic and it will synthesize to an adder for you. So I haven't gone through the actual process of creating a, a carry 
like look ahead adder or ripple adder or any of this thing, I've just said counter plus one and my synthesis tool will say, oh, he needs an adder that's 32 bits for this and we're gonna do it all for him. Okay, so I'm continually counting at some point it will overflow like you've discussed in lecture uh, and then I'm gonna visualize various bits of this. Okay, now for the PCF file, uh, this again, like I said, will tell you which variable name corresponds to actual physical pins on your FPGA. In this case, we have LEDs. Uh, so I have set IO dash dash warn no port just will warn me when I compile this if the port I specified doesn't actually exist, uh, like I made a mistake. And then I have the variable name on the left, LED1 for example, and the physical pin mapping on my FPGA on the right. So that says B5, and I can either look at the schematic online for this device, or some of these pins are labeled on the actual square here, and it'll say B5 next to whatever pin. Uh, and a very important one there is J3, that's the input 12 megahertz clock. Okay, uh, the make file I've listed here, I'm not gonna go into it, feel free to explore it. You'll see those tools I listed earlier, uh, Yosis, Arachne, and Icepack. That's our synthesis, bitstream, downloading, etc. Okay, so let me show you what this actually looks like. All right, so this is the code in my LED um, Blinky project. Ignore this for a second. Okay, so I'm in that folder now, and if you're unfamiliar with command line terminal type commands, just navigating directories, you might want to spend five minutes and just kind of familiarize yourself with commands like ls, which lists um, various files, cd, which will change directories you can navigate and things like that. It's really important knowledge to have if you don't already have it, so just spend five minutes and look up um, terminal commands. Okay, so I'm in here. Um, if I do ls, it will list everything. Uh, I can change it to my Blinky directory. This is my project. I have top.v, I've got my pin map, I've got my make file. The only thing I need to do from here, and this is on the GitHub if you forget this, I type make. This does the entire compilation. It creates my bitstream, etc., but it doesn't actually program my device. Okay, if I want to program my device, I type make space burn. Burn is just what I decided to call it. It's a holdover from a long time ago when you had to actually, um, you know, quote unquote, burn code into devices. And I was hoping that wouldn't happen. This is a, a slight uh, caveat with Max. It's also on the GitHub, uh, so don't worry about this. Okay. Uh, the commands I just typed are on the GitHub if you need, if you have the same issue. Uh, okay, so it's programming. It's actually downloading the code onto the FPGA. At, uh, at the point of completing the downloading, it's going to read back the code and it's gonna verify that what it wrote was actually the correct data. And then we can look at what's actually happening on the FPGA. Okay, verify okay. And if I go over here, you can see that my LEDs are flashing and it looks like binary counting, okay? If these were the lower bits, you wouldn't be able to see that they were flashing. Okay, cool. So we did a Blinky project, but we want to do more than that. Um, and let me just jump ahead. Your optional project, just to kind of motivate this, will deal with reading in digits from a keypad and doing a sort of reprogrammable digital lock, okay, where a user will input a sequence of numbers and it will either lock or unlock a device. So that's why I'm talking about buttons right now. So uh, anytime you work with hardware, you have to deal with these sort of non-idealities and weird things that aren't really described by pure digital logic, but you have to deal with these electrical issues, okay? So I'm gonna talk about reading a button press, which sounds like a simple thing, and it pretty much is a simple thing, but there are some strange things you have to deal with. Okay, so we have this keypad, like the one you see here. This is the same keypad we'll hand out to you if you're doing the project. Uh, it has seven wires coming out of it, and that's four rows and three columns. Okay, uh, you might expect an output and an input from each button, but that's not the case. The way it's actually constructed, uh, and I'll jump ahead a little bit here. 
Um, okay, this is how it's actually physically constructed. If you uh, press the button four, for example, all the all the buttons on a single row are connected by default. So, for example, four, five, and six are all attached to row two. And if I press down on button four, it will connect row two to column one. All right. So what that means is, if I'm just looking at column one, if I touch a, if I press four. I'll see the same signal as if I were to press 1. Okay, because I'm looking at column 1 and it's going to either change status because it's connected to row 2 or it's connected to row 1, but I might not have a great way of telling uh, if it was a 4 or a 1. Okay, so it might be a little bit confusing, so I'll back up and we'll deal with that later. Okay, so if you're looking at an input, we already looked at outputs with our LEDs. Now we want to have an input to our top level module and those inputs are our button lines. Okay, what we're gonna do in order to read from these buttons is to use our rows as an output and to use the columns as an input. And if I press a button, it will connect a certain row to a certain column, but if I'm not pressing a button, then we have no knowledge of what the actual input is doing. In electrical terms, it's floating. It could be anywhere between a zero voltage and a high voltage, but we don't know what it's doing, so our behavior is going to be undeterministic. All right, we're, we're not going to know what it's going to do. So what we need to do is we need to um, initialize the input pins to a certain voltage. And in this case, we're going to initialize them to a high voltage because that's what our FPGA allows us to do. Okay, so we're going to um, work with something called an active low button. That means uh, when it's active, the voltage is pulled low. Otherwise, the voltage is, is high. And that's shown by this plot here. Right when I press a button, the voltage goes down to zero. When I release it, it comes back high. Okay? Um, the issue is I need to initialize my input pin to be high. And our FPGA itself allows us to add what's called a pull-up resistor. It's a very weak resistor between an input pin and a high voltage. Um, and the way you do it is kind of this nasty little bit of code here. You don't have to know what's going on internally here. Just know that uh, this binary data in the top of here, this is a module like Salma described, uh, and the top code here will tell it to initialize a pull-up pin for a given input. The input name is keypad C1. That's my personal name that I came up with it for. Uh, and then the output of this pull-up resistor is going to be keypad C1 DN, data N. Okay, so the actual name of the pad is keypad C1. And then the signal, the wire that I deal with in my Verilog code afterwards is keypad C1 data in. Okay, and I know that might be confusing, uh, but it's in the examples. So you can kind of just take the example code and apply it to your needs. Um, so don't worry if you don't understand exactly what that's doing. Okay, the other thing that we need to talk about uh, is physical non-idealities in the button. So if you look at an actual button um, and you look at the metal contacts that are made when you press down on it, if you were to zoom in really far with like an electron microscope, you'd see these really small um, pores and bumps on your button. And when you're pressing down on the button, it doesn't necessarily make a very clean contact. And when you're releasing the button, it doesn't necessarily you know, break the contact very cleanly either. So if you actually zoom in on an oscilloscope, for example, uh, on the signal, as you press or release the button, you might see something like this plot here, which is actually taken from this exact keypad on one of the tools we have in lab. And what you'll see is if you zoom really far in on time, this is microsecond scale, you'll see something called bouncing. Your signal doesn't cleanly go from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1, but it oscillates back and forth. And if you have a clock that's operating at 8 megahertz or 12 megahertz, then this will actually trigger multiple edges on your button. So I might press it once, but it might my system, if it's not smart enough, might think that I actually pressed it three or four times. Okay, so this can easily be taken care of two ways. One is hardware if you have filters, but we don't care about that because it adds components, it adds cost. Uh, and a simpler way is just to have a very simple finite state machine in your code uh, in the form of a counter. So all you need to do is once you detect a pin change, once you detect a transition from a high voltage to a low voltage, for example, you start a counter, uh, and until that counter expires, you don't allow there to be any more 
changes. You don't allow there to be any more button presses. Um, and now it's a really short counter. It might be a few milliseconds, but the debouncing will typically happen on a scale of tens of microseconds. So all you need to do is have the short timer and you're okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so uh, these demos are all about buttons. I have three, and I think I have enough time for all of them. I have more demos afterwards, so we will see. Okay, first I want to show you what happens if you don't initialize your pin, you don't use a pull-up resistor. And again, all this code's on GitHub. If you want to see these results, this is a button, no pull-up. So let me go to that project. Again, this is only a top.v. There's no other files for this one. I have a keypad row one, a keypad column one, and I'm going to use these for my button. I have an LED, and every time I have a negative edge on column one, I'm going to say, hey, there's a button pressed, and I'm going to toggle my LED. Okay, so if everything worked fine, which it won't, every time I press the button, the LED is going to toggle. But I don't have that strange bit of code that uses the pull-up resistor, so actually when I'm not pressing the button, we have no idea what the pin's going to be doing. Okay, so in this, I go make, I go make burn again. It might seem like it takes a while, but the non-open source tools take much, much longer than this. Okay, all good. So now if I look at, I have this keypad attached here, uh, and this is set to row one, column one, which if you look at that diagram corresponds to button one, and I'd expect when I press this, I've pressed it about 20 times already, I expect the LED to start toggling, and it's not doing that. but you see, I'm just wiggling the wire here, and I've got this strange electrical noise, and my LED starts toggling. So it doesn't take much at all to have these weird electrical signals manifest themselves on my input because I don't have a resistor to either a high voltage or a low voltage, and my pin's floating. I have no idea what the voltage is. Okay. Oh. All right, so I have another demo that um, adds the pull-up resistor, but it doesn't add the debouncing we talked about. I'm going to skip that, but you can explore it on your own if you'd like. I have another, a third one, that both adds the pull-up resistor and does the proper debouncing, uh, and I'm going to talk about that one now. Okay, so first if we look at the Verilog code for this in top.v, there's two differences. First is I have this strange bit of code we talked about. This does the pull-up resistor. So I know by default, my input pin is going to have a high voltage, which means when I look for the negative edges, it's going to be a nice clean negative edge. Uh, and the other thing is I have my debouncing timer. I've chosen to make a 32-bit timer. I have this seemingly arbitrary debounce period I've defined. Uh, and again, I said this earlier, D allows me to define my period in decimal. I have set it to be uh, 120,000, I have a 12 megahertz clock, this comes out to a 10 millisecond debounce timer. Okay, uh, and you can go through this on your own, but I'm essentially counting on, uh, on my timer as soon as I see a key press. So for example, um, here, remember I have an active low button, meaning if I don't press it, it's high, if I press it, it's low. So this is pretty much, uh, it looks like C code here. But I'll say if it's, if not keypad C1 data in, in other words, if keypad C1 data, data in is low, meaning I pressed it, and I'm not currently debouncing, then I'm going to start my debouncing, and I'm going to toggle my LED. Okay, otherwise, um, down here, I'm incrementing my timer. If my timer expires, I'm no longer debouncing, and I reset my timer, um, etc. Uh, and we can go into this in detail afterwards if you want to see me, or you can explore the code on your own. But let me program this and show you the result. <laughs> 
Okay, so it looks like before, but now every time I press 1, my LED is toggling exactly as I expected. If I were to do this, uh, the one demo I didn't do where I have the pull-up resistor but I don't have debouncing, every once in a while when I do this it might toggle twice. It might toggle on my release again because I come up and then back down and I see a negative edge and I do that a couple of times. So you wouldn't see this nice clean little signal I'm putting out here. Okay, any questions about button detection? All right, um, okay, so you have a keypad. You don't just have a button, and I wanted to quickly describe something you would need to do for your project. Um, you, you need to detect um, multiple buttons here, for example, buttons one through nine, uh, and you can't do that in the exact same way I just demoed because um, if you were using row one, for example, and you want to detect the difference between one, four, and seven, like I said before. Um, so the way we were doing that is we set these rows to a, a low voltage, we set the inputs to a high voltage, when we press the button the input goes from high to low, right? So if pin 1 is a low voltage, uh, which is row 1, and if row 2 is a low voltage, then pressing either 1 or 4 makes column 1 go from high to low. So how do I know if I press pin 1 or pin 4? Um, and you don't know. But the way around it is to share these buttons in time by scanning across all the different rows. So that's what this little timing diagram I have in the bottom left here is. Essentially, you want to take turns looking at each individual row. Uh, so by default, you make them one rather than low voltage, rather than zero. And if they're a high voltage, if I press a button, my input, which was high to begin with, is now connected to a high voltage and I see no change. But each row takes a turn going to a low voltage activating that row so that when I press a column I now know that uh, you know if row 2 was active and I press column 1 I know that I press button 4 not button 1. Okay so this is the kind of thing you have to take into consideration if you're using the entire keypad rather than just one or two buttons out of your keypad. Okay any questions about that? <laughs> Okay, and this is for your reference. Um, if you were using the same code that I wrote uh, and you wanted to test that for yourself, uh, these are the pins that you would put in your pin map file on the far right here. These are also the physical pins you would connect your keypad module to. And you'll notice an unfortunate caveat with the development board we have. They have ground pins spaced evenly on these pin headers here. Uh, which means the best thing we can do is to unfortunately get rid of one of our rows here. Okay, so you have a 4x3 keypad, but unfortunately you cannot use the very last row. So you have digits 1 through 9, uh, You pressing star, 0, and pound doesn't do anything for you. So we'll ignore those. Okay. So let's quickly show a simple state machine in Verilog. So Sama showed you um, the traffic light example and how to simulate that uh, on EDA Playground. I'm going to show you a slightly different one that has to deal with button presses. But before I do that, I need to talk about a key difference between what happened. Okay, I need to talk about a key difference between the state machines you talked about in lecture and um, the state machines you will see in practice when you're dealing with user input. Okay, and the key difference is that in lecture uh, you might have looked at state machines where at each individual clock tick the input could possibly change. All right, uh, at each rising edge you would look at your input and you would advance your state to whatever the next state would be. But in practice, if you're looking at button input inputs, button presses by us, and you have a clock that's, for example, 12 megahertz, when I'm holding down a button, my clock will have ticked hundreds, thousands, or millions of times. Right? So at each subsequent clock tick, I don't necessarily have a new button pressed by the user. Um, so instead, 
You need to advance your clock, your state machine every time you detect a new button press rather than every time you have a clock. Uh, and that's pretty easily done, especially if you look at the code that we use for the debouncing, it's quite similar. You write a rule that will detect a certain button press. For example, I have a negative edge followed by a certain amount of minimum time in a zero voltage state. Uh, and then I say, okay, there is a button press and I don't allow there to be a new button press until the key has been released by the user, meaning my voltage has gone from zero to a high voltage. Right, so you kind of create these rules that say, okay, this defines a button press. I will advance my state machine at each button press rather than at each clock cycle. Does that make sense? Okay. So given that, I uh, can ignore that. Given that, uh, let's look at a very simple state machine. Um, and we're looking at a simple code on our keypad. So we want to do something if a 1 and a 2 and then a 1, 1 was pressed on our keypad. Um, we'll just blink an LED or toggle an LED if that happens. Uh, otherwise, we'll just turn that LED off. Okay, so really easy to write this up as a state machine as you've done in lecture. Um, as soon as we get, and I've done it as a melee machine, as soon as you get to a 1, 2, 1, 1 state, the output on that transition will be a 1. And that output I will assign to one of our LEDs. Okay? Simple enough. The way that actually looks if you're looking at the code uh, is just a whole bunch of case statements like Sama was talking about. Depending on the state you're currently in and the inputs you see, uh, for example, press here is if I've pressed a 1 or not. Uh, depending on what state you're in and what input you see, you advance to whatever state your state machine dictates. Um, so pretty straightforward. And I'll show you how it looks on the actual hardware. This one's already compiled, so I'm just going to burn it. Okay, so it's loaded up. Uh, I've assigned LED 1 to toggle if I press button 1. LED 2 will toggle if I press LED 2. LED 3 will be on if I'm in my unlock. It'll be off otherwise. Okay, uh, and I had an error with my binary earlier, so if this doesn't work, that's why. All right, so I'm pressing 1. My first LED is toggling here. If I start pressing 2, my second LED is toggling. If I go 1, 2, 1, 1, my third LED turns on. I'm in my unlock state. If I press any other button, for example, a 2, my lock goes off. Okay? So very simple, finite state machine just by using case statements, uh, defining your states, and defining your transition logic. Okay. Let me describe one other very simple state machine that's useful for a whole bunch of applications. And this is serial data communication. So your FPGA has the capability of uh, translating something called UART, which is a very simple serial communication, to um, USB protocol that will be displayed on your computer. Okay? Uh, and the way UART works, it's very simple. Um, we're just going to look at the transmission of it from our FPGA to our computer. And the way this works is you start at an idle state, which is an output of a 1, and you can transmit in bytes at a time. Okay, so if you want to start transmitting a byte, you go from a 1 to a 0, that's your start bit. You then um, transmit each individual bit, 0 through 7, uh, least significant bit on the far left, most significant bit on the far right, you know, um, most recent in time. And then when you're done, you will go from a zero voltage or whatever bit was bit seven to a high voltage and that returns to an idle bus. So if you're not transmitting anything by default, it's a voltage high, okay? 
so you can write this into a really simple state machine depending on what character you wanted to transmit. So for example, if I wanted to transmit an ASCII uh, code that is 7, right, it looks like 7 to our eyes. If I look at the ASCII standard, um, a 7 is actually a 55 in decimal. And this is uh, an actual um, capture from one of the scopes in our lab of this protocol. And it goes from a default idle bus high. It sends the low voltage for the start bit. And then 1101100 is 55 in binary, which gets translated into 7 in ASCII. And then it sends the final 1 for a stop bit. And you can see at the very tail end, it goes low again because it's just repeating this. Okay? Um, okay, so this will allow me to communicate from my FPGA back to my computer. Um, okay, and this uses something, uh, uses modules like Salma had talked about. And by the way, the previous finite state machine used modules as well. Um, and let me just show that real quick because uh, whenever you're doing a lot of complicated things, for example, this ugly pull up resistor nonsense that we had to do. Uh, it helps to really make abstractions for yourself and make a hierarchy so you don't have to deal with all of that. Um, so just quickly, uh, in the top level here, I had a button for the previous one. Uh, and I can just instantiate that the way Salma talked about. And now I have a nice clean signal called press 1, press 2. I don't have all the debouncing code that I have to look at because that's in a separate file called button.v. Uh, and for UART transmission, I have a similar thing. I have a top-level file here, uh, and this will do. This will make my transmitter module, which is described as a state machine in this file here, which you can look at on your own. Uh, I have to make a 9600, uh, 9.6K uh, clock in order for my UART to work. Uh, if you're curious about that, you can just look up um, the UART protocol. And then I start with a byte that is ASCII 0, and I will add to it. Um, and when it gets to an ASCII 9, I'm going to roll over. And every second, I'm going to increment from 0 to 1, etc. OK, I'm rushing here because we're getting out of time. But I just wanted to show um, real quickly Um, so once it's transmitting code, you need something called a console or a serial console program on your computer. If it's Windows, that's something like um, uh, TerraTerm or RealTerm. If you're on Mac or Linux, it's, you can use something called Screen or Minicom. Just search serial console program, uh, and there's any number of free programs you can use to visualize this data. So I'll just be using Screen because it's already installed on Mac. Ignore that command, it's on the GitHub again. And um, the device will show itself in this folder called slash dev. Hopefully. All right, it doesn't want to do it right now. OK, that's all right. Um, if I was running screen, you would see a whole bunch of zeros being printed to my screen. Um, every second would go from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, etc. When it got to 9, I have an if condition in my Verilog code, which will roll that back over to 0. Um, so if you wanted to debug or print, you know, have the equivalent of a printf in your Verilog for the actual hardware, you can do that using this. You can send ASCII data, binary data, etc. OK. Um, so if anyone wants to stick around and actually see that demo, I can do that. Um, otherwise, any questions, I'd be happy to take. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So that's handled in the make file, and you do have to explicitly tell it. So if I were to look at something simple like my Blinky, if I look at the make file, all my files are here. Um, this one's only top.v. If I look at something that has multiple files like buttons, uh, no, let's see, the FSM simple, I have top.v, I also have button.v. So if I look at my make file, I start by defining it 
top.v and each subsequent file I use, I have to append it to my files list. Good question. Any other questions? All right, so take a look at the ice, uh, ice storm program, um, the actual information on this lattice ice 40 chip. Uh, and this, um, these slides as well as, all, as well as all this code will be posted online for you to look at. Yeah, and we'll also post instructions on Piazza on how to proceed with GitHub and GitHub.